Hello and welcome to Laney Let's Analyze. Today I am going to show you how I would get layers and other things in the visual cortex based on a task fMRI activation data. So before I go further, I would like to mention that this data set is coming from Cheryl Allman's lab and one of their PhD students, Joe Emerson, reached out to me a few weeks ago and asked some questions about Laney. During our conversation, I just had the idea to use some of his data set to make an instructive video for others. He was kind enough to respond positively to this. And here I am going to show you some of the Laney analysis steps by using Joe and Cheryl's data sets. Okay, first thing to do, let's understand our data. In this video, I'm going to be a bit quicker going through these details and maybe skipping some parts. Okay, first thing that we should have a look at our EPI data set. You can see that this is an EPI T2 star weighted data set. This partial coverage imaging slab is positioned at the occipital pole to cover the calcarin sulcus, as you can see here. This data set is already three times upsampled. So what does it mean? Let's come here and see quickly using the handy NEMAT program. And you can see that here, this data set is at 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution now, after three times upsampling, which means that the original resolution of this EPI data was 0.6 millimeter isotropic. And this is a personal preference, but for using Laney to its full extent, it's better to uh, have our images resampled at around 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution. And uh, here I'm just starting from all the images that are already being at 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution. Okay, the second image that I'm going to show you is their T1 weighted data set that is already nicely registered on top of the EPI image. And here I am just using what Joe sent me, just like uh, resampled it a bit. I'm just taking it as a good enough registration uh, for the region of interest. Okay. And here you can already see that this is an upsampled T1 weighted image that is registered to the EPI space and then upsampled to 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution. And you can see that there are quite a few interpolation artifacts. When you do upsampling, you can of course choose what interpolation method you are going to use. And here I believe I used a cubic interpolation, uh, if I remember correctly. So, okay, problem number one. For getting layers and doing layer analysis in this type of data, we first need to draw various gray matter, cortical gray matter is, right? However, our input data is acquired at a lower resolution. It's not truly 0.2 millimeter resolution, but we have upsampled the data to this resolution, both EPI and also T1 weighted data. So first thing we would like to achieve is to increase the sharpness of our upsampled anatomical image a bit so that we see the gray matter a bit more nicely. To do that, I'm going to use a nonlinear and isotropic smoothing method that I have implemented a few years ago myself in one of my repositories called Segmentator. If you are interested, you can come here and see what's on the screen. Okay, first thing to do, I call segmentator filters and then give my upsampled anatomical image as an input and then use feature scale 2.0 and then save every fifth diffusion iteration and then maximum number of iterations should be 10. So we will have two images basically at the end. Okay. So now let's run this. Okay, so I already have the output here anyway. So let me show you this output quickly. And here, once we load this as an additional image, and hopefully you can appreciate the quality difference in a YouTube, after the YouTube compression, but basically, here, let's look at before and after. So you can see that all these interpolation artifacts that might actually confuse us in, in some ways when we are trying to segment this data or try to validate and judge the segmentation, knowing the outer and inner gray matter boundaries are of utmost importance. So 
these interpolation artifacts when we upsample the data to 0.2 mm isotropic will give us trouble. However, by using a little bit of this nonlinear anisotropic smoothing uh, filter, we can kind of uh, smooth the data in the right way while preserving the boundaries so that you can see before and after and after is a much more natural appearance and a bit easier to comprehend in 3D. Okay, so after this step, I'm going to do something that is implemented recently to Laney and that's called the uh, gradient magnitude program. So let's call LN2 Gramag. There is some explanation in the help menu as usual. And in the LN2 Gramag, now I'm going to call with my filtered image and compute the gradient magnitude image. Okay, let's let it run. It should take a little bit of time. Okay, the gradient magnitude image is computed. Let's have a look at that. And here it is. I add it as an additional image. And now, hopefully, in this gradient magnitude image, you can easily appreciate where is the gray matter, cortical gray matter. Because after upsampling and smoothing in this nonlinear anisotropic diffusion filter way a bit, computing the gradient magnitude in some cases can give us a lot of information. And here you can see that I can easily now separate where is the white matter boundary, where is the gray matter, and where is the CSF boundary. Okay, these images look quite nice now for what we want to do, which is analyzing a small chunk in V1. Let's have a look at uh, to, to which end we are going to use this data. And of course, this is an fMRI study, which means that there will be some functional maps acquired. And here I have loaded, uh, and I have already a little bit processed this and upsampled it to 0.2 mm isotropic resolution as well, the statistical map. So these are, as far as I learned from Joe, these are beta maps and they had four task conditions. I mean, the details of the uh, task fMRI is not so important now. Uh, I am kind of being light on these details. So I have upsampled this statistics map three times, to, which, is, which arrives at 0.2 mm isotropic resolution, using nearest neighborhood interpolation. And I like to do this nearest neighborhood interpolation in statistical maps because it keeps you grounded by not um, like changing the spatial characteristics of your statistical maps too much. It's a bit of a personal choice. So I like doing nearest neighbor when it comes to statistical maps and upsampling. Okay, the first image looks nice. Maybe I can actually visualize it as a overlay in ITK snap and I can change the color map maybe to hot color map to give it a bit more familiar appearance. And maybe I can put it on the T1 weighted data and increase the minimum a bit so that we are kind of seeing them almost as activity maps. Here you can see. Uh, these are, of course, untresholded activity maps right now. If you can see that. And I, I believe this is the region of interest for Joe. So I'm going to focus on this region, not outside right now. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that there are actually four maps in this nifty. It's not a 3D nifty file, it's a 4D nifty file, nifty file. And you can see that now I am going through, uh, the, I can change the time points in ITK snap as so. So these four maps are four beta maps and they belong to four different stimulation conditions. Okay, and our task is to inspect the laminar activity within V1 in this region. Okay, so... These are the inputs that we are going to work with. And now that we have brought the anatomical images to a level that we can uh, nicely segment or evaluate a already done automatic segmentation on, let's proceed to the next stage. Okay, so here we are. I went back and loaded the EPI, T2 star weighted um, average run image here you can see the image and then I have 
loaded here our initial upsampled and co-registered T1 weighted anatomical data set. Then I have loaded here our processed, um, like sharpened, maybe we can call it, upsampled anatomical image, and also the gradient magnitude file that is very useful and easy to see the, where the gray matter is. Okay, now let's load on top of this a segmentation and Joe already sent me a segmentation file so I'm going to use this as our starting point here and now okay let's have a look so this is the initial segmentation I believe maybe this can be a free surfer segmentation and he just uh, relabeled the relevant tissues on the left hemisphere for me and this segmentation is already in the format that Laney likes, which is called the RIM format, which means that gray matter is labeled with the number 3, white matter is labeled with uh, number 2, and outside of the gray matter is labeled with number 1. As you can see, this segmentation is done at a lower resolution, not 0.2 millimeter resolution, which is normal for most automatic segmentation packages. And here is where the tricky parts or the or the important part starts because now we should be able to really be careful about how we achieve the gray matter segmentation from this file for instance just by looking i can see some um, like errors here and just to say that these ex errors always exist in automatic segmentation programs if you look long enough, you will you will find errors somewhere. But I mean, hopefully some of you can see that maybe this part is going outside a bit too much. Maybe there is actually a sulcus here, but that is not completely disconnected. And let's start and let's continue to have a look around. And for instance, maybe here there's a touching border. Maybe it could be a good idea to separate it. So I see that there are some places where we need more work in this segmentation file so okay where to start oh and by the way like you look here here is the white matter and outside of the gray matter is touching to each other which is actually uh, not possible in a healthy brain on the cortex so there is some work to be done in the segmentation file let's proceed first step is actually masking it and how I like to mask is actually to draw a big bubble or a circle, or a sphere, a ball actually, around my region of interest. So I know that Joe is interested in the calcarine sulcus and specifically a region around here. So I just went ahead here and draw a large sphere around this to include that area. So, okay, once this sphere is drawn, I call it scoop. You can call it scoop of interest. Now I'm going to mask this initial segmentation file. And although I already created the files, uh, I will, I'm going to demonstrate. So to do that, I'm going to use nemat. I give my input, use the mask command, and I give my scoop of region of interest sphere. And then I'm going to save it as the masked region. Okay, so the operation is done. Let's see what has changed. Oh, and here you can see that now my segmentation is only limited to that sphere. This is good because now I can focus on only the areas inside the sphere and not get distracted by the regions that I'm not interested in. So this is fine. The next step will be something actually new in Laney. Although in the previous videos I have explained a little bit, I find that it is not so maybe straightforward for many people to follow the steps that I'm doing. So I made a program out of it. I'm going to smooth these stepwise edges a bit. Okay, to do that, I'm going to use this file. And in Laney, I'm going to call ln2 rim polish. That's a, this is a new program. As usual, you can read the readme file, but basically I'm going to give it a rim file and then we'll just let it run. 
And here, although I already created, I'm going to redo it for you to see. I give it the input, I give it an output path, and now let's see what it will do. Okay, the operation is done. And let's have a look at the difference before and after. Okay, this was before and after a bit of smoothing. So this is already nicer. However, when I compare the segmentation to the processed, upsampled and processed file where my gray matter is highlighted, for instance, here I can see some segmentation uh, errors. You can see that the white matter is too thick here and it's not a result of smoothing. It was just too thick to begin with in the initial segmentation. And maybe the sulcus is a bit too thick. And I can, for instance, here at this region, see that some part of the gray matter segmentation is definitely out of bounds. So it is going towards the uh, longitudinal sinus position here. And this is a bit clearer to see in the gradient magnitude image. So it would be wrong to put layers here. That's the important part. This is why we need to be careful. Because Laney is designed to work in the voxel domain and particularly at 0.2 millimeter as a tropic resolution domain. This is important. However, this is also important for other software that use surface analysis. Because sometimes these errors can be uh, not so straightforward to trace um, if you are not too familiar with the regions and if you are not highlighting your tissues of interest in the right way, you might think that they look fine, but there will be some errors. Okay, what are the other maybe parts to fix? For instance, here, if we zoom in, we can see that maybe it would be a good idea to extend this sulcus so that this sulcus that is like quite highlighted in the gradient magnitude image indicates that we need to separate these two gray matter. They are not together. And these all have implications on the layering. And maybe here you can see that Again, like gray matter is not thick enough. Uh, or maybe white matter is too thick here. Okay. So after this step, I'm actually not going to show you what I exactly did, but uh, you can see it in my previous videos. I did manual editing for, uh, I think, around one and a half, two hours, only within my region of interest to get a better segmentation by correcting some of these uh, errors that I'm seeing. And now let's load my segmentation. So this is, by the way, right after my manual work. Okay, now let's have a look at the before and after. So before, after, before, after. And since around this region is our region of interest, I am mostly focusing around that region. So let's have a look at here. So before, after. So this is nearest neighbor, upsampled, smoothed a bit. Of course, you can see that now, after smoothing, some details that are present in the nearest neighbor upsampled is lost. And these things are expected, and then it is regained when I did a bit of uh, manual work to detail this region. Okay, so in my uh, view, this is a much nicer or much more accurate and precise segmentation for our region of interest. However, there is one issue, and that is, since I did manual work and I can only work on 2D slices, there will be some of these uh, manual editing residuals or artifacts. You can see them as these jagged edges. Okay, many people actually look at these things and they got worried, ah, oh, manual segmentation is not good because it gives such errors and so forth. But these are quite easy to fix, to be honest, with the right amount of morphological operations applied and the right amount and right type of smoothing. And luckily now, they are all in Laney within one program. And that is again, and this is the real purpose of the program that I just showed you, which is LN2 Rim Polish. And this program is really designed to be applied after you manually polish your Rim file. It can be also some other semi-automatic automatic method, but if you want it to be a bit more like smoothed, uh, this is the program to use. Okay, now let's use Rim. 
I give it my manually edited file as input and for output I'm going to call it uh, polished let's wait a little bit okay it is done and let's have a look at our results there you are so before after before after before after hopefully you can see that most of those manual editing artifacts are taken care of and they are taken care of in a way that like thinly segmented areas are not lost to a very large degree yeah. and lost meaning that they are like smoothed out and um, reverted our detailed segmentation work so this filter so this was our starting point uh, you can see with regards to the underlying data and this is our endpoint I mean of course uh, maybe there are still some residual errors As you can see I had limited time to look into this data but for our region of interest I deem this segmentation good enough and improved from before okay so now we have this nice segmentation file let's go ahead and start generating some layers to make some layers i'm going to call ln2 layers program and then i will give it the rim file this segmentation file as input and i'm going to request it to generate equivolume cortical measurements as well and just to see although it's not so important i'm going to request five layers oh and by the way i am also at i'm going to add curvature so that i can make use of the sulcus and gyrus that are computed by elanto layers later in the analysis okay let's go okay it's done in around a minute i think now let's have a look at our outputs of course always check your inputs check your outputs let's have a look at quickly the layers file it's a segmentation oh here you go here are our layers so i can overlay it on top of my epi t2 star weighted data i can use the t1 weighted data i can use the gradient magnitude data and hopefully appreciate the layering okay these look all fine let's have a look at our equivolume sampled layers and here they are equivalent or maybe let's contrast them with regards to equidistant so here it is correctly when in when we are in the sulcus it pushes the deeper layers to be thinner and more superficial layers to be thicker and in the gyrus uh, for instance here it pushes the superficial layers to be thinner and deeper layers to be thicker this all looks good and your usual reminder that actually these layers files are just a very straightforward end result of the metric files and metric files are the the core of laney actually or laney layering and these are basically continuous between zero and one scalar measurements that are then binarized in an arbitrary or custom way however many layers you like into into layer bins but ideally you can make use of this smooth data to determine your each voxels where they are with regards to the two surfaces okay let's have a look at our mid gray matter file also looks good it all looks good okay and let's check for a moment our curvature file bind and this file nicely shows us where are the sulcus and where are the gyrus which will be useful later okay so now the next thing i would like to do is to go to this area of interest that we have and basically flatten that piece of cortex to in to investigate the laminar fmri activity patterns 
Okay. So to do that, I'm going to load the mid gray matter equidist file here. I can even use the 3D viewer to see where I am. So see, so this is the calcarin sulcus basically. I can click around in this mode. And the moment I like the area that I am in, okay. So now I'm I am now preparing our my input for my next analysis step, which is multilaterate. And to do that, I am going to just select a one size, one voxel size brush and activate the label two, and just put one voxel to green here. And let's save it as control point zero so now we have our control we have our control point file and now let's run ln2 multilaterate requires a few inputs first one is the rim file and the next one is the control points file okay and the next is to determine the radius of our disk that will be fitted around that green voxel that we have just labeled. And let's give it the radius 10 millimeter. And actually that's it. Okay, let's run it. So we look at the parameter as a quality control. Okay, as you can see, the disk that is grown around our green voxel is there. It looks like a disk. And here the important point to check the quality of multilaterate is to make sure that this green lining at the perimeter of the disk is always present and always there. If it is interrupted, it means that maybe you are too close to the borders of, the, of your partial coverage slab. There are ways to deal with it already in Laney, but now I'm not going to talk about it to not make the video even longer. Okay, the next output I'm going to check is the perimeter chunk. Let's load it as a segmentation and see. Okay, it looks all right. Every edge is green without interruptions and it seems to fit perfectly within my slab. Okay, great. Now, it means that um, after multilaterate, when it runs successfully and when we check the quality we have computed two orthogonal uh, axes within this surface so we have effectively parameterized the cortical surface which means that we can now flatten it to flatten my disk i'm now going to call ln2 patch flatten and i will start by first giving a values file and this is the file the, the values the numbers that will be flattened in my first run i'm going to use the curvature bind image here and then i'm going to use chord uv which is here oh by the way this is another output to check for quality uv axes and in this output it should be visible that there are these two orthogonal of course like geodesically orthogonal axes that are embedded within your disk if these axes doesn't look orthogonal it means that something went wrong but here they look pretty much orthogonal so they divide our disk into four quadrants almost equal in volume okay that's good let's continue with our patch flattening then i'm going to give the third parameter of the surface which is the d coordinate the depth this is the, the, the other orthogonal axis that parameterizes our gray matter chunk. And for that, I'm going to use the equivolume metric file. Okay, equivolume metric file is there. The next thing I'm going to call this program needs to have a bit too many inputs, but they are all necessary. I'm going to give the parameter chunk as my domain file so that it will only flatten that disk that chunk 
and for the result I'm going to say create a flattened disk at the resolution of um, yeah let's do 1000 let's see 1024 and means the how many like 51 is it too much yeah let's say 101 <laughs> Okay, and then also call the Voronoi flag. You can see my other videos explaining more detail what these uh, mean. But okay, let's call it and let's see the result of this one. Oh, actually, like I decided to decrease this a bit just to make it faster for the video. Okay, so it provided two outputs. One is called folded cords underscore Voronoi and the other one is called Voronoi. So folded cores is the file that you need if you want to go back. But right now we do not want to go back from the flat domain to the folded domain. So it's not uh, required for us to have a look at that. So now let's load this file. And here it is. So you can hopefully see that this is our calcarine sulcus. And this is the disk that we were seeing in the folded form a minute ago. But now completely flattened. And now let's do the important part, which is running the same command. However, now instead of curvature, let's use the statistical map. I just added the statistical map into this folder for easy access. And now instead of our curvature map, let's give the statistical map. And remember that our statistics map had four maps in it. And let's see if patch flatten will flatten all four maps at the same time this is actually something i have implemented also recently after talking with joe and the idea came when i was visiting cmr last year and and talking with cheryl and other members of her lab you can see that it's doing the fourth dimension one two three four so probably it's working let's see and here it is okay let's have a look at this map Okay, this is our first map, and you can see that actually, <laughs> in this region, it seems that there is a bit of a mid-layer activity. Look. Hey. Um, let's visualize it. With a hot color map, quickly. And maybe let's increase our threshold a bit. And there you go. Wow. I mean, this is a this is an arbitrary thresholding. So I am just showing this to demonstrate how Laney tools can be used. Of course, this statistical map has to be properly thresholded by whichever approach you are using. However, it seems that in this first map, yeah. I mean, if our segmentation is correct, if the co-registration is correct, if other things are correct, there's a chance that in this region, we have a mid-gray matter laminar activity. Let's have a look at this for a second. So this is the top, I believe. This is the bottom. And yeah, of course, the activity increases towards the top mostly. Okay. There is this issue though, I have updated my ATK snap and now I cannot easily see all my four dimensional files, um, the, the fourth dimension. I know the maps are there because I saw them uh, in my Linux computer, but for some reason uh, this part of ATK snap got broken a little bit. Um, okay, what if I just load this file first? It says one out of four maps, but it doesn't allow me to change it for some reason. Ah, here you go. <laughs> when I load it first as the uh, as the main map, it allowed me to browse through different time points. Okay, let's do it the other way around, <laughs> which is a little bit more annoying, but fine. Um, let's change the mapping. And let's decrease our, let's adjust our activity pattern. And now, 
And here you can see that, oh, for instance, in the second map, there is lots of superficial activity. I don't know the meaning of this. I think uh, Joe and uh, Cheryl will look into this further. But uh, here it is. Some cortical landscape analysis with laney. Yeah, I see this like middle gray matter thing here, um, which is present in all of the con all of the maps. So, so yeah, who knows? Who knows? I mean, I <laughs> I don't even know what was the stimulation to be honest. But um, this is how you would get a folded. Uh, brain do a partial coverage fmri imaging and then if you have some special theory of how the laminar activity should be this is a way to basically arrive at a flat patch with a high accuracy and precision and visualize your activity patterns statistical maps or whatever okay that's it for today because it's already a long video there are few other parts for instance how to plot laminar profiles within this ROI I think I'm going to make a separate video for that thank you for listening have a nice day